And our New Testament reading this morning comes from the Gospel of John, chapter 14, beginning in verse 1. Do not let your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house there are many dwelling places. If it were not so, I would have told you that I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and will take you to myself, so that where I am, there you may be also. And you know the way to the place where I am going. Thomas said to him, Lord, we don't know where you are going. How can we know the way? Jesus said to him, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you know me, you will know my Father also. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. Philip said to him, Lord, show us the Father and we will be satisfied. Jesus said to him, Have I been with you all this time, Philip, and you still do not know me? Whoever has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, Show us the Father? Do you not believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me? The words that I say to you, I do not speak on my own, but the Father who dwells in me does his works. Believe me that I am in the Father, and the Father is in me. But if you do not, then believe me because of the works themselves. Very truly, I tell you, the one who believes in me will also do the works that I do, and in fact, will do greater things than these, because I am going to the Father. I will do whatever you ask in my name, so that the Father may be glorified in the Son. And if anything in my aim, you ask me for anything, I will do it. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Thanks be to God. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Yo soy camino y verdad y vida. And God in Exodus said, I am. Soy. I am. These are among the greatest theological expressions of our faith. I am the way, the truth, and the life. I hope they would be imminently familiar to you, and yet there is so much depth in them that we could plunge down into. If, if I had time, if, if there wasn't Advent, like just creeping up on the horizon, I could preach at least four sermons on, on this one verse. I don't like it when preachers do that, because because when I was sitting in a pew, I never liked coming to church and, and the pastor would be like, and the scripture reading for this week will uh, start off with uh, where the, the last one left off with kindness. Um, goodness here ended the reading. And here's my sermon on good. Like, I just, I want more scripture than that. <laughs> but if, if, I, if I didn't, dislike that kind of preaching. I mean, I could easily spend all this morning talking to you just about I am. Just about the fact that Jesus echoes the word of God in the Old Testament, and he uses that same expression to tell us who he is. God says, I am. And Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Jesus is God. And he's telling us He's God as he tells us who he is. And who he is, and this would be week number two, is the way. Jesus isn't just 
a way. One way, Jesus is the way. Nobody comes to the Father except through Jesus. He's the way through which no one comes to the Father except through him. He's, he's the way. He's the Camino, the, the way you get there. And then we could talk about the truth. And we could talk about the fact that Jesus isn't just true, that Jesus is the truth. And then we would talk about the life. Jesus is the life. Jesus is the font of life. It's not that Jesus is alive, although he is. It's that Jesus is the source of life. Jesus is tapping into an idea that's deeply embedded in Greek philosophy about the search for eudaimonia, the good life. What does it mean to live a good life? How do I know if my life is good? Is a good life a luxurious life? A pleasant life? Or is a good life a virtuous life? That's what Socrates would say. That to, to live a good life is to live a life of virtue. And Jesus takes that a step forward and he, he disciples us and shows us a life following God. A life of self-sacrificial love. A life that he calls eternal. The eternal kind of life, a life that never ends, a life that matters forever and continues forever, that death has no dominion over. Jesus is the life. But like I said, I, I can't give all those sermons, so you're just going to have to preach them to yourselves. You're just, I mean, open up the Bible when you get home and, and take a look at those words and think about what every single one of those words means because they're all important. But I, you're all smart. I mean, I mean you know, the Hebrews talks about milk and meat and, and babies drink milk, but you're, you're pretty mature in the faith. I think, I think you can take a fork and feed yourselves. You know, you don't have to be fed. There's, there's something to be said for the fact that I, I think you can, you can know where I would probably go if I gave a sermon on I am, if I gave a sermon on the divinity of Christ. And if I talked about the truth that Jesus is God and that Jesus says he's God and why that matters that we've had a God in human form face to face with us. I, I think you kind of get the idea. I think you could probably preach the sermon to yourself about Jesus being the way. About Christian exclusivism. About the belief that we believe that belief in Jesus is a special kind of important because following Jesus is not just a way we like to live, but the way to live, the way to get to the Father, the way to follow God, the way to eternal salvation. I, th I think you, you get that. You, you've seen the implications of that, and you probably have an understanding of Jesus as the life, if not an intellectual one, at least an intuitive one. If you've been living with Jesus for a while, you know what it means to have life in Jesus. You know what that feels like. The, the sort of life that bubbles up in you like a fountain when you're with Jesus. That life comes from Jesus. And that for all life, everywhere, even life that doesn't acknowledge Jesus, it owes thanks to Jesus for it being alive. Because Jesus is the source of all life. Have you got some idea of what I mean by that? Shout something at me. Respond to me so I know that you're here. You, 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 is Jesus the life? Yes. All right. Is Jesus God? Yes. Is Jesus the way? Yes. Okay, what about the truth, though? That one, I think, is the hard one. That, that one, I think, we should spend some time talking about. We know that Jesus is true, just like we know that Jesus is alive, that, that, that Jesus you know, was a thing that was living. But, but when Jesus says, I'm, I'm the way, the truth, and the life, we're actually confessing that Jesus is truth personified. That if truth itself 
got out of bed in the morning and put on clothes and arrived in human form, that would be Jesus. And that's a concept that is deeply connected to this Sunday in the church calendar, Reformation Sunday. It's a Sunday when we remember the people who risked their lives for the truth, the people who faced death and persecution and social rejection to say to the church, wait a second, you're not standing up for what actually is, what is the case, and we need you to because you worship the I am. God spoke to Moses and he said, I am. Unlike all of those other vending machine gods that you put a quarter in and you ask for what you want, I'm real. I'm the God that actually is and that matters. It matters that I'm the God that's real. And reality matters. And then Jesus entered into that and said, I am the truth itself. I'm truth personified. But in our culture, in our world, truth itself is not very popular, right? Truth has been under attack lately. And I'm not just talking about in the evil secular world, you know, in Hollywood and the sinful, you know. I'm, I, even in the Christian subculture, if you, you listen to Christian radio and buy Christian books, it, it, the truth, it's just not valued the way it should. We, we all of us, have become disinterested in what's true in some ways. We prefer what's useful or what's familiar or what makes us feel good to what's real. And the tools that we have learned that help us to learn and know and determine the truth, tools like logic and reason and evidence and argumentation and science, some of those tools are, are denigrated, dismissed. They're thought of as rude or stodgy or pushy, close-minded. And that shows that we have a disconnection with Jesus, who is the truth, if we feel that way about those things that guide us to the truth. Many young Christians are encouraged to think less and feel more by their Christian religious experience. That's a very, very common complaint. And they, they start to have doubts and questions about their beliefs. And we tell them, try not to think about it. Don't think those thoughts. And it doesn't work. It results again and again in people losing interest in truth because we don't represent it as the truth. And so it doesn't seem like the truth. We, we, we represent it as, as community, as, as family, as fun, as religion, as tradition. But what about reality? And, that, and that's just in the church. I mean, it, it's everywhere. Have, have you noticed that on the TV nowadays, you can pick which truth you want to hear? My truth versus your truth. Oprah's truth. It's a whole other ball of wax of truth. Would you like to hear, turn on the channel for the Democrat truth or the Republican truth? They have different channels now. You can pick whichever channel you want. If you go on the internet, red feed, blue feed, I mean, you can pick whatever reality you want. Would you like to find, you do your research, 
Find the experts that recommend saving your money and making sacrifices to live uh, the, the best life down the line? Or do you want to hear the experts that, that will advise you and say, listen, anything can happen. You need to enjoy your life today. You don't want to be one of those people that skipped dessert the night before the Titanic sank. You know, that was a luxury liner. That's, you want that dessert. You can find either truth you want. Have you heard the study about how social media is ruining the kids today? Did you post it and share it with your friends on social media? We struggle with truth. What's true to you? Is that true to me? Is truth even a thing? Can we know it? Perhaps we should be asking Pilate's question, the question that Pilate asked Jesus. What is truth? Do we even know? Would we recognize it if we saw it? If we did recognize it, if we were forced to recognize it, would we welcome it? Or would we reject it and exchange it for a more comforting lie? The Bible tells us that when truth came to Jerusalem, we rejected it. We didn't recognize it. We put it up on a cross and killed it. But the truth came back. So it can't die. And it's into this context, this community, this sort of a world that struggles with truth, that struggles to be committed to truth, that struggles to love the truth and appreciate the truth for what it is, that Jesus proclaims, I am the truth. Echoing the burning bush claim that unlike all those other gods, I am. Truth is important. Truth is worth striving for, living for, dying for. Truth is powerful. So when you spend time in your life teaching a young child how to read, or helping a young person to think critically, not to follow in whatever he used to believe, but to, to think about things in new ways outside of the box. Or when you take risks socially to confront lies and distortions in the world around you, or learn about history and science and mathematics, when you do those things, you're doing Christian work. You're honoring Jesus and growing closer to Jesus by representing truth. When we bring about more truth in this world and make the world a more truthful place, we do the work of Jesus Christ. Because Jesus is the truth. When we lie, when we take shortcuts, when we do the thing that's very common to do for Christians, where we don't technically lie, but we just kind of don't tell the truth, right? We, we just kind of tiptoe around the reality and allow what is incorrect to be believed, right? Now, daughter, you tell me, did you smoke a cigarette last night? Tell me the truth. No. Three. Then we put Jesus on the cross. We reject Jesus when we do those things, when we reject the truth, when we avoid the truth, when we escape the truth. We're escaping the loving arms of Jesus Christ who wants to guide us and forgive us. And it doesn't matter where this truth comes from. If it is true, it's from God. If a Hindu sage gives you advice and you find that when you follow it and carry it out in your life, it works and it's good advice, thank God. 
If an atheist scientist discovers something about one of the cells in your body that you didn't know before, and it is true, it's God's truth. All truth is God's truth, and we worship the truth if we worship Jesus. The truth cannot ever, ever, ever be a threat to Jesus. If we ever fear the truth, think that the truth, think we might have to choose between Jesus and reality, the problem is we just don't trust Jesus enough. If, if we feel that tension, it's, it's because we don't really believe that Jesus is who he says he is. Because he says, I am the truth. But if we know the truth, and we share the truth, and we love the truth, the truth will set us free. Jesus said, I am the way and the truth and the life. Because God said, I am. On Reformation Sunday, we remember again the story not only of Jesus, who shared truth with us and died on the cross, but the story of the many people who carried that truth through the centuries to even this church gathered here today. The story of Martin Luther, who, when confronted by the religious establishment for speaking the truth and asked to repent of the truth and say something that was not the truth, say that the Catholic Church was right and the truth was wrong, said the words, here I stand. I can do no other. I have no choice but to follow the truth. May you have similar boldness as you live your lives for the truth of the gospel. In the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.